you have your Bibles today, I'm going to turn to 1 Kings chapter 20. I'm going to begin at verse 37. In all honesty, this is a, an amazing chapter, and I've, I've preached from it a number of times. And it's really difficult to try to get to the end of the chapter here to preach this little thought because there's so much here that I've pulled from throughout the years. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to snatch a, a statement an incident to pull from and uh, hopefully encourage you today. Amen. Say amen if you're at 1 Kings chapter 20. Beginning at verse 37. <laughs> amen. Then he found another man and said, smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him so that in smiting he wounded him. So he said, I want you to hit me enough to wound me. I want to be wounded. I want to appear as though I've been in a battle. I'm interrupting, so I'm going to have to get some stuff to catch you up to what's going on here. So the prophet departed. He, he asked, I want you to wound me. Hurt me. And after he got wounded, the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself. <laughs> now, if you've been around long enough and I've read enough to where over the years there's been some pastors of churches that have disguised themselves and come to their own church to experience what it's like to be a visitor in their church. I did a little research. There's a pastor just got voted into a huge church. And on his first service, he showed up as a, as a homeless man and watched how the people of the church interacted with him. He gets up and pulls the fake hair off in the front and everybody's... And they all got convicted because they realized, oh. So here's a man of God. It's not, not, it's not new, it's in the body. He disguised himself. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. With ashes upon his face. So he's disguised himself. He's got, he's wounded, and he put ashes on himself. So he's, he's going whole Hollywood here. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. <laughs> And behold, a man turned aside. So this lets you know that pastors can embellish. I'm teasing. <laughs> and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life. Or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. Verse 40 is actually where I want to key off for our lesson today. And as thy servant was busy here and there, The king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. Thyself hast decided it. He was busy here and there. Anybody been busy lately? Here and there? And everywhere? You can't seem to get it done? Every time you turn around? You know, guys, them honeydews, yeah. It's not even in season, but honeydews running around my house. <laughs> Honeydew projects. Mm. Let's lay our Bibles down. Let's take a moment. Let's lift our hands, our voices. Let's ask God to speak to us today, Jesus. We need you, God. There's so many here and there's in our life right now that we, we're, we're, we're so easy to overlook the task that's been handed to us, the, the, the responsibility that's been placed in our hands, God. I, I, I pray for an impartation, for some help, for your, your presence, God, to move in each and every one of our hearts and our minds that we eliminate the here's and there's and be about your business. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. 
Paul, speaking to the Galatians in chapter 5, verse 7, he, he utters a statement to them. He said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Some of us know how to be busy real good. Some of us are real good in, in priding ourselves in our ability to be busy. You run good. But what hinders you from obeying the real task that you've been handed? Acts chapter 2 verses 46 and 47 declared, and this is after the, the amazing preaching of, of, of Peter and the plan of salvation, and he makes this statement, and they continue daily. It doesn't say Sunday, <laughs> Wednesday, or the next schedule event. With one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That is a picture of a focused church. And I'm talk, not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people. I'm talking about those that have been called of God, that have, been, that have repented of their sins, baptized and have received the Holy Ghost and calling themselves a Christian. They're doing what Christians do. Today we have Christians doing what Americans do, but it's hard to find Christians doing what Christians should be doing today. Paul goes on and says, and let us not be weary chapter 6 of Galatians, and well-doing. He's not talking about well-doing of Galatia or America. He's talking about the things of God. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Now, like I said, our text today is kind of grabbed out of the, the ending of a, of, a, of a chapter of some amazing things that have happened. And it contains the little story, a great little element of a, of a prophet that's acting out a parable that it's intended to give a message to the king. The prophet is basically issuing a, uh, a skit that is an, actually a rebuke for his dis disobedience and leniency in dealing with Benadad. He was given clear instructions, but in all the things that were going on, he failed to do what God asked him to. God, God lived up to his side. He, he, he delivered them. He get, gave them victory. And he, he appointed for Benadad to be destroyed, but instead, Ahab made a bargain with something he should have eliminated. Ahab spared what he should have destroyed. He, he, he let go of what God said to destroy and let live what God wanted to move. He disobeyed. And his, his failure of obedience at the simple task that caused God to use the man of God to bring about his own words, bring in rejection. He judged himself. His own words. That, that's why, and you've heard me say this, and I'm going to say it again. Be careful that you want to live according to your word. It's far more judgmental than his. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't think I can say that enough. There's so many times, oh man, we put our foot down, well, bless God, it ought to be this way. And then two weeks later, oh, wait a minute, I just, now I know none of y'all do that, but you know, I, I kind of find myself struggling with uh, living up to my own expectations. And so sadly, he unwittingly brought God's judgment upon himself. That is the message that's being conveyed in this living moment parable. The whole message is especially interesting because 
parallels or looks a lot like Nathaniel, the prophet who confronted David in his sin when he murdered Uriah and committed sin with Bathsheba. In both instances, the man of God presents a parable, speaks to us in parables and allows these kings to pass judgment or assess with their own judgment, which they both did. In this parable, we find a man busy about everything, but at the cost of neglecting his duty, and that's what the man of God was doing. I, 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 I was given this task. But I got busy here and there, and my task evaded me. There are plenty of people who are busy in the world, but never do their actual duty. Something to think about when you realize Jesus said, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? However, in all honesty, it is not my desire and not my intention today to focus on Ahab and Benadad themselves. But I do want to focus on the point of the parable. Can we talk about the point of the parable for a few moments today? I'd like us to focus on that and how it relates to you and I. How does this how does this help me, Pastor? Well, if you notice, the parable contains the confession of the man who failed. In fact, we hear from his own lips the story of his failing. And he says, I was in the middle of the battle when a man brought to me a prisoner and gave me command that I must keep this prisoner. Whatever you do, you can't let him escape. You can't let him get away. You have one objective. You keep this prisoner. He's a high-value prisoner. You guard him with your life. You have no other responsibility. You cannot let this guy get away. You cannot let him escape because if you do, it will be your life. So immediately we understand at that moment that the entire battle that's raging of all the stuff that's going on and all the stuff he's surrounded with, he is given one task to focus on been singled out. He's been given a specific mission. It is no longer about a generic battle with the enemy. He's given his own calling, his own responsibility that he's accountable to. His focus is no longer the attack or the defense of a position. This specific task is his objective. And unlike everyone else that's in the battle and everything else that's going on. He is now to focus on a single task, this one chore, this one job, this one calling. This responsibility should encompass everything that he does. Everything that you do is all to surround this one thing you're responsible for. Don't let him get away. That's his only job. Secure the prisoner. Make sure he doesn't escape. Sounds simple enough. Now, let's stop and think about it for a minute because all of a sudden he's, 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 he's teaching this lesson. He says, imagine how these instructions transform the mindset of a soldier. You're in the middle of a battle and someone comes and gives you a specific task. But he, the first thing he has to do is drown out all the other distractions. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He must even disregard the other orders given to the whole army. If they're told to advance, they're not talking to him. He's been given specific instructions on what to do. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. It's fair to assume that with these new orders, that he would maybe make his way towards the back of the battle, back to base, command center, now, he's not doing that out of cowardice, but rather out of an understanding of the gravity of the situation that I cannot allow him to be freed or go fall back into the hands of the enemy. So I can no longer afford to stand here and linger and hang out with what everybody else is doing because I've been given a specific task. I can't afford to stay here. I might get overwhelmed by the enemy and... Mishap happens and I turn around and I've 
messed up my only responsibility. Because now he's responsible for a prisoner. The life of a prisoner is as his own if he gets away. I don't know about you. I've been trying to get a hold of Walmart, a police officer. Hey, y'all got some handcuffs because I'm going to handcuff this joker to me. I can't let him get away. We've all lived long enough and seen something where, where we got some special agent and they got a handcuff in there to a briefcase. In other words, whatever's in that briefcase is worth the loss of my hand. That's what that says, folks. Are you here? That's what that says. So he's got this one single objective, and he's got to make sure that he doesn't mess it up. The, the battle, how the battle is fought, is no longer a concern. Instead, he heads back to the rear, back to the command post, back to where he'll be supported, hopefully, by some friendlies, because that's the safest place to keep a prisoner. The moment handed this task, this, this, this prisoner, his life changes. Because up until this time, there'd been many worries. There'd been many concerns. There was a battle raging. He was surrounded and had to fight. There are a lot of things that he may have been responsible for, but now it all boils down to one command. Don't lose this prisoner. You got one task. Don't lose it. You got one responsibility. You got to keep a hold of it. And I'm sure you got what I'm talking about now, right? Basically, this one thing trumps all things. All right. It would seem that once he passed back through the lines and got to base, that once he, once he got the, himself and the prisoner back away from the fighting, away from the heat of the battle, that, you know, the task of securing and keeping him would be kind of simplified. Okay, we're, we're here, we're home, I'm surrounded by, by good guys. I can just, just kind of relax a little bit. Great position to succeed, right? Okay, however, by what we read, his own confession, confession it really wasn't quite that certain because you see, somewhere along the way, Somewhere apparently his mind wandered from the task. He got caught up in other things. Despite the severity, despite the importance, despite it being his sole responsibility, despite the one task given to him, some other things. We're not told what they are. We're not even given a idea. We only know from his own confession that he suddenly found himself busy. Not the business of the battle. Not the life and death struggle that he'd been busy in before he was given charge of this prisoner. But he uses these words, I was just busy here and there. I really can't tell you what they were. They, they really pale in comparison of importance that I can simply, I was just here and there, and I was just busy. For the sake of being compassionate, maybe, maybe the guy that was keeping the flocks or keep, keeping the cattle or keeping the beasts of burden, said, hey, you know what? I need some provender. I need some food. Could you go run? And I don't know. Maybe when the cook said, listen, I need you to go get this back. I got to make bread for the... You know what? Go to the quartermaster. We need some new arrows for the troops. I don't know. It just says here or there. Whatever it was, we know two things about it. First, Next to what he was tasked to do, it was insignificant. Because nothing mattered more than the specific job he was given. Secondly, it so distracted him that he completely lost track of his prisoner. He lost complete track of his sole responsibility. And by his own confession, he said, thy servant was busy here and there and
Jerusalem is going to be taken. And with those words, with those words, just here and there, he's condemned. It's not funny anymore, is it? It's, 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 it's not something to laugh at now, ought we? How could something so important be lost so? To, to, to read this portion, to, to, to use this text for, for our admonition, it is the confession of someone who failed, someone who started out understanding the cause, the reason, the purpose, but with no real response for the failure, just here and there somehow, I misplaced the most important thing I'd ever been handed. I was given clear instructions, a, a clear task, and I understood the importance of the task. I understood the gravity of the task. I, I, I I wasn't overwhelmed by enemies. I just got busy here and there. I, I, I wasn't defeated or beat down or wounded. I just got busy here and there. I, 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 I was not incapacitated. I was not in the hospital. I hadn't fallen asleep. I just got too busy. I just got too busy. A troop of soldiers didn't break through the lines and free him and take him from me. I just got too busy. I wasn't ambushed in the dark or even attacked as I slept. I simply got too busy with trivial things. I let myself become distracted. I let things that were so insignificant that I can't even name them. I can merely label them. I was busy here or there. I was going here. I was doing that. And really, it's not worth mentioning next to the task. But I still find myself having lost I lost the importance of the mission that I had been given. I dropped the ball. In fact, while it was going on, it didn't even occur to me that in the midst of my busyness, the midst of all that was doing the most important task that I had been given was lost to me. I was taken by the trivial. I was distracted by the insignificance and I failed my one responsibility it's tragic it's a sad situation it's, uh, if you've ever lost anything or had anything stolen from you or, in fact I was, I was listening to a guy talk about how it's, it's, it's uh, organized crime that's really taking our vehicles now because it's so much easier with all the technology just to pull up and find the, the, the radio frequencies emitted from your key fob, go get a key fob with the same one, come back, start your car and take it out uh, and just drive away. Uh, 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 I listened to a guy tell a story of how he had just brought a brand new truck and he came home and he, he parked, he had it for a couple of weeks and, and one morning he gets up and he goes to take the trash out to the front and he's just standing in his driveway wondering what's wrong until he realized he was standing where his truck should have been. It's a sick feeling if you've ever been ripped off. It's a sick feeling to lose something of great value that you just expected it to always be there. Somehow, he allowed himself to become so involved with so many other things that he lost sight of his real purpose. He got involved in what could easily be labeled as trivial pursuits and lost his own true purpose. And though a lot of minor things get done here or there. Can I get an amen? We got a lot of things. Oh, I got that done. I got this done. But did you get the most important thing accomplished today? He failed the one thing that really mattered in his life. 
I don't know if there's anything more tragic than getting minor things done while major things are left undone. I, I don't know about you, but this this parable, this this story, this 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 concept speaks to me. It, it, it invokes an urgency in me, and I wonder how often we let ourselves get bogged down with the here's and there's, and we allow the things that are inconsequential become so important to us. We're almost angry if we get erupted. in life how many times do we allow the calling of God in our lives our, our true mission of impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ the one true responsibility that he placed in our hands to become subordinated by the meaningless petty pursuits of here or there how many will stand on that great day in judgment and join their voice with the soldiers from the parable and say, I, I just got busy. I, I was here. I was there. I, I just, I just, I, 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 I really don't have an answer. I just was busy with here and there and I forgot. They were minor things and when I look at them and look at my life, they really didn't matter. It just was, I just merely got busy and while I was busy, my heart drifted away from God. While I got busy, I grew cold in my soul. I, while I got busy, I, I allowed God to drift away in importance and I didn't even realize at the time that I had fallen into the rut of my own routine and got busy with here or there that I neglected my purpose. I was busy. I was burdened. I was struggling with all the things that I had to get done and I got busy with here or there. And before I knew it, the unction of the Holy Ghost had slipped away from me. We use terms. I've used terms. Man, the day got away from me. I don't know what happened, but time got away from me today. I got busy with this. I don't know where the time go here or there. What happened to your purpose here or there? You were called to great things. You were called to be great. You are fearfully and wonderfully, marvelously, meticulously made. What happened here or there? I wonder... If that's kind of the story of the, the five foolish virgins that we read about, five wise and five foolish, what, how, how could that happen? There were so many similarities. All it really meant was when you get low, go get some more. It's not complicated. All it meant was stay ready. I'm sure they wanted to be ready. Come on. Nobody really wants to fail. And that's the problem. It's so easy to allow the here or the theirs of life to steal us of what's most important, to rob us of our real responsibilities. It's so easy to fall in to the pretense of keeping up with the Joneses that we misplace Jesus. I want to be ready. I know it's the most important thing in my life, but somehow I just got so involved. I, I just got so busy. I, I was being pulled this way and that way. I, I had to run an errand. I had a job over here. I needed to get this done. I had to get that done. I got appointments. I got meetings, luncheons, and dinners. And before I knew it, the stores were closed and I couldn't go get oil. It's too late to buy oil. And really... Really, in all honesty, to, to, to trace the history back, I'm sure, like them, like you and I, I comfort myself so many times with the hope that, you know, I got enough. I'll, I'll go get some tomorrow. Maybe he won't come tonight. I'll, uh, I'll go tomorrow when the sun rises. He didn't come. Well, I can go another day without really... Are you hearing me? And then another day and another day and the 
bridegroom doesn't come. So, you know, that's okay. You know what? Next week, I'm going to have a little bit more money. I'll go next week. How many of us have even cautioned ourselves? Hey, I better get this thing right. I better get some oil. I, 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 better, I, bet, I, bet, I better get some oil here. I can, uh, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me, I'm, I'm going to do it this week. I, I'm going to be faithful because I look around and I see empty seats of people that should be here. You're not working, you're not this, you're not that. You're, you're here or there. And so how many times in my own personal life I've cautioned myself, oh, I better get back to that altar. I, I better get back full. And, and then it happens again and again and day after day. And life becomes so busy and everything gets so encumbered that busy here or there. I'm just taking care of the mundane and neglecting the master. And another day goes by and once again I failed to prepare. I failed to buy the oil. And pretty soon it's day after day after day. It just becomes my life. But then on that fateful night, the cry came. The bridegroom came and those five realized they, although they knew they waited too long in the here and there, they, they waited too long in the here's and there. They got encumbered and caught up in there. We look like them. People think, I, I look just like them. I wear a suit just like them. I wear a dress just like them. I sing and worship just like them. But you never got into an altar and you never got the oil filled. And the bridegroom came and went. I was too busy here in the midst of it all. I let my oil run dry. I let myself down. I can't blame anybody. I was busy doing my own thing and I was here and I was there. But I wasn't where I should have been. I, just want to take a few moments and, and, and love somebody enough to preach to somebody today that you need to stop today and take stock of your life. There's nothing more important than the condition of your soul and how's the level of the oil in your life and how's the level of your real walk with God. I, I know you can put on the right clothes and sing the right word and carry a Bible and call yourself a Christian. But when is the last time truly that you put the condition of your soul at the top of the list. There's nothing more important than maintaining the oil, the Holy Ghost. Don't let yourself get so caught up in running to the here's and the there's and so busy about all the trivial affairs of this life. miss out with God. Nothing is as important as your walk with God. Nothing. And, I, and, and, and the, the danger of, of my message today is I've heard it before. I've preached it before. It stirred me before. But I still find myself sometimes in the here's and the there's and chasing this and doing that that I find myself, Jesus, where are you today? There's nothing in this world. Nothing in this world, I don't care what kind of status you think you achieved in the here's or there, what kind of place you found yourself or even the blessings of God that you call them here or there are worth your soul. There's nothing in the world that matters more than making heaven your home. And if we ever heard this message, we need it today in a country that's turning upside down, disregarding God, wanting to do away with all these things of God. You better find out right now if you're here or there or in his presence. And sadly, I am amazed at my own ease to be easily distracted <laughs> by the inconsequential affairs of this life. How many times I 
set myself to study. I'm going to finish this book. I'm going to read that chapter. I'm going to write this chapter. And the next thing I know, the day got away from me. It was my one purpose. Where'd he go? He was supposed to be a prisoner. It was supposed to be most important. And I find myself here with nothing to show for my life but the here's and the there's. I believe it's time to stay, take spiritual stock. To be honest, the cost of living causes each and every one of us to rise up day in and day out, to run to a job, there are bills to pay, wants to fulfill, dreams to achieve. We push ourselves as hard as we can. We involve ourselves with so many things. <laughs> Sunday. It's not going to matter if I miss it. It's just another Wednesday. It doesn't matter if I'm there. And we've relegated the most important thing in our life to below the here's and the there's. You got your bill paid. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, you got, you got your house paid off. Oh, hallelujah. You're amazing. Oh, you got a new set of shoes. Oh, amen. Placed him while you're chasing the here's and the there's. Each of us is so easily wrapped up in this life. Amazingly, we're fully invested in financially, emotionally, and socially in the plethora of pursuits of this world that are trivial at best next to our soul. So let me sound a note of caution if I haven't done enough already. to lose your grasp of the high calling of God on your life. I don't want anyone here within the sound of my voice to lose the focus on God's purpose for your life. I want someone today, even if it's just one, to get a glimpse and grasp and understand I've got to get this thing worked out and get my priorities Settled. I've got to heed the many biblical warnings that we are given. There will be those. There, there will be those that will stand at the seat of judgment and seek to defend themselves. But Jesus, haven't I not prophesied in your name? I've cast out devils in your name, Jesus. I've done so many wonderful things. Jesus thought, saw fit to let us know that the Lord will turn them away on that day saying, depart from me. I never knew you. Sadly, yeah, there will be those who wants to live they had been on the altar of sacrifice. They had felt the mountaintop of miracles and blessings and been completely surrounded by the love, grace, and mercy of God. And they've even walked close to God, but much mightily used by him. And that will have nothing else to say except, oh, I got busy here and there. I don't want to be numbered in that crowd. I, 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 I don't want to be numbered in that crowd. I, I don't want you to be numbered in that crowd. I, I, I want to safeguard my soul and have you safeguard your soul and make your calling and election sure. And it's a decision that simply says, I'm not going to be chasing the here and the there. I want to pursue him. Right now, in the midst of all the chaos and the false Christianity, there is a clarion call going forth to reorder your priorities, to make sure you don't lose your focus. One of my elders wrote a book titled, The Main Thing is Keeping the Main Thing the Main Thing. And I know it sounds simple and to some even a bit trivial. That indeed is the point of the message. It doesn't matter how long you've known the Lord. 
we all could use some honest evaluation. It's sad that we do more evaluation of our vehicle's oil level than ourselves. It's a sad day that we're so good at keeping the house running and the garbage disposal working, except in my house. Um, got someone who loves to drop a rag down there. I'll get to it. <laughs> She's over here talking. She didn't even get it. She's chasing a here or there over there. I don't know. Are you hearing me today? We need to be vigilant. Be sober. Why? We got an adversary that will throw a here or there at us. We'll be so busy trying to do that. I can't help but think of Samson in this. And I want you to stay with me because this is going to end well. And hopefully it's going to end soon. Can I get an amen? Amen. In Judges 14 and 4, there's something that's said about Samson. A lot of people are born, but Samson was literally born for a purpose. The Bible uses an amazing word in verse 4 there, and it says, but his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. It literally means that God was seeking a quarrel. Come on, some of y'all, you know, you get home with that wife or that husband, and you, you want to fight about it. You ain't no letting it go. You, you're seeking a quarrel. You know, when he walks in that door, you ask him to take that trash out, you ask him to pick up them shoes, or you ask her, please, would you just keep, would you turn that stove light off and just, yeah, that's a $15 bulb, that's a $2 bulb, please. I'm telling on us just a little bit. <laughs> can, can I get an amen from some couples that understand? There's a lot of here, there's in our life. There's a lot of quarrels. And God himself is mad at the enemies of his people. So he literally, I'm going to raise a guy up because I want someone that will fight. Not one another, but the enemy. See, 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 after a lot of people have been dismembered. Oh, that's so good. I could preach on that. Oh, you're here, but you've been incapacitated because of an offense or an issue. <laughs> oh, I'm about, to, I'm about to give you some word that's going to help you. Let it go and let it die. You ready? He was born for a purpose, occasion. Literally means to seek a quarrel. Samson was anointed for a cause. He had amazing potential on his life. He had a great calling of God upon him. He was supernaturally empowered to win. He was given an advantage. God gave him a supernatural advantage. God tipped the scales in his favor. You know why? He's God and he can do that. Come on. we've all. <laughs> if you're not cheating, you're not trying. God, God makes the rules. He is the rules. He can do what he wants with the rules. Devil, I'm, I'm going to have an advantage on you. I'm going to send my dude against all your dudes, but my dude's going to be better than your dudes. Because he can make those rules. We have the opportunity to be supernaturally empowered. Why do we want to be like the enemy? Some will get that, some will won't. You ought to write that down. So he was given an advantage over the Philistines. And that advantage was amazing. It was supernatural. So he had all the power. He could do amazing things. But what happened? He lost focus. He was too distracted. He let the temporary things fulfill what his potential was supposed to do. He'd get busy here and there. And we'll lose track of the very thing he was born for. There's a parallel here for those of you paying attention. And much like the prodigal, he wasted himself on lesser pursuits. 
it's so much quicker to do this and get men to pat you on the back than it come on we, we how long was strong service was long today how long was that good lord I got a bunch of people can't tell time how long we can sing for 40 minutes but how many can you get down and pray for 40 minutes I can preach for an hour and a half. <laughs> now, I can get down in the praying position for an hour and a half, but I don't know how productive some of the minutes are. It's so easy. It never fails that there are so many here there's that crop up when you try to pray. Samson was constantly falling short of his destiny because of his self-imposed distractions. You can't be in church as much as you got to work more hours because you bought distractions. Maybe it's not even that common. Maybe I just like it. It helps me amuse myself. And so we're messing and fooling around with the here, the amusing amusement of the here and there instead of being awed with the almighty that we have access to. And as painful as it was when Samson's enemies sought to destroy him, hear me, they unknowingly assisted him. The enemies did a favor of Samson. He messed up. He fell. He got distracted. He could have been all He could have been one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Come on, guys. He could have been one. We'd be naming our kids Samson today. But because of the just the mark on it, oh man. So we go with the Pauls. And I don't know, we go with the Davids. Anybody been checking his life? Anyway. But Samson was such an utter failure because of the potential, right? I have potential. How's that song go? Someone help me. Oh, anyway. We all, and I want you to think as yourself, as I got potential. I can do this. You can sing. You, you can be an amazing witness. You can, you're only not able to do what you're unwilling to do. Okay. Now, let me get past that little pep talk. Samson was falling short because of his self impulse. He was chasing the here or there's. Instead of pursuing his purpose, as painful as it was, with that hot poker they put out his eyes, they did him a favor because without even realizing it, they blinded him to the distractions that had hindered him. Samson was helped to focus by what he finally lost. He may have lost his eyes but he got rid of the distractions. Samson was chained to a grinding wheel and forced to labor like an animal, grinding grain to the amusement of his captors. However, in them doing that, in that prison house, God managed to allow Samson to be placed in a situation he had never been before blinded to the distractions that hindered, chained to a burden, and that's good, because his mind was finally free to contemplate his real reason and purpose. The cost of his fall ended up paying dividends in his purpose and in the cruel darkness that he was thrust into, that was thrust upon him. Samson was able to achieve in that darkness a clarity of vision that he didn't have on his own. Jesus makes an amazing statement that I want you to listen to. Now don't go do this, just listen to the spirit behind it. Matthew 18, 8 and 9. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, pluck them off. 
and cast them from thee. For, for it is better for thee to enter into the life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Wow. I'm not shocked nobody's running and shouting about that verse. <laughs> but it gives credence to Samson's ultimate victory because it reminds us there are more important things than this life. There are more important things than the image. The here theirs are a distraction because what it's saying there is I can be maimed. I can be marked by the scars and the failures of this life, but I'm still going to make it. I can, have, I can have failures and losses, but I'm not going to give up. <laughs> Paul told us, Paul gave us, if anybody been through some stuff, tell them to keep his focus. He was, I prayed thrice. He says, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. <laughs> Even though blind, <laughs> all of a sudden Samson could see clearly the higher purpose of his life. Uh, even though bound, he had been set free to be busy about his purpose. Everyone taunted him, made sport of him when the enemy thought he's finished. When it all looked lost. One day, a blind, bound man of God had enough humility through all the self-imposed pain. To notice while grinding at the mill as a breeze blew. The gentle brush of the locks that had grown back on his head. That feeling that it had been a long time. Oh. And I believed there was an instant that he realized. with his eyes gone and no more distractions to turn him aside. I believe daily he waited and he looked for an opportunity that he believed God would surely give him. And finally, on, 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 what a, on a day that the Philistines were partying and parading and using him for sport, they didn't realize that their party provided purpose. And the enemy's prize became the enemy's problem. And before all the Philistine royalty who sought to humiliate him, Samson recovered his purpose. And he said, hey boy, hey elders, sometimes we need to allow the younger to speak to us. The simplicity of humility. Lead me to them pillars, boy. Yeah. I can imagine feeling the hair on his face and hearing the jeers and the screams and the cries of sport. And they made fun of Samson. They said, huh, look at that little boy having to lead him. He'd been humbled, but he hadn't been thrown away. Right. Let my hands feel them pillars, boy. And then finally, that the man that would look like he was going to go out with a whimper, that looked like he was going to be erased from everybody's right. memory, this, this failure that got distracted and caught up in the right. foolishness of this world and the pride of life and the lust of the eyes, found his hands upon those pillars. And, Restored the purpose. 
shoved against everything that had beat on him. And with a mighty shout, he got an ultimate victory because he got tired of the here's and the there's and let me find my purpose. stand the Philistines were not really prepared to deal with the Samson hear me hear me this is for you even though I'm talking about Samson the Philistines were not ready to deal with a Samson that was no longer distracted they could not handle a bound and blind, undistracted Samson on a mission. Oh, I hope someone heard that. I hope someone realized that. I hope there's someone here right now turning their eyes upon Jesus, binding themselves from all the foolish distractions and life things, that wasting your time away to nothingness. Can I tell you hell cannot deal with Hell cannot handle dealing with you and I as we focus our attention on the things of God. Hell cannot handle a church uh, full of the purpose of God, working the plan. Hell cannot handle a church that's eliminated the distraction and focus on our true purpose for being here. I believe today more than ever that right now in this house there are some folks that are going to rekindle the purpose. Look again and activate God's purpose. We're given a promise. Acts chapter 2. No, no, no. I'm not going to verse 38. Listen, 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 listen. Put your antennas up. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. Right here, right now, somebody. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. All young men in this house. Your old man shall dream dreams. That means we get to sleep a little bit. But Terry, we can sleep a little bit. But Lawrence, okay, sleep a little bit. You young guys, quit crying. Get a vision. I'm going to get drained. And on my servants, is there any servants in the house? Yeah. And on my handmaidens, all the ladies said, amen, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor. Yeah. Anybody want that today? Yeah. Anyone want to get to that place in God today? Are you tired of the here and the there? Are you ready for purpose? Anybody want him to pour out his spirit upon you again? You may need a child to lead you today, but I'd like it if you find yourself up around this altar today. Come forward. I want to tell you that I know it was metaphoric and it was a skit, but I refuse to stand in eternity next to that soldier in the parable and vocalize the epitaph of a wasted life. I refuse that my final statement be I was busy here or there or things just got away from me. Today I have determined that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I got purpose. 